is the Big O Show. How you feeling, bro? You feeling good? I'm doing well, man. Another week. One week goes into the next. Week one into week two. Big road win. And now another big road game. Sunday night football. So that's always exciting. What's your uh, What's your gut tell you about Teron Armstead? Yeah, he has, he just uh, went through his second day of practice participation. Now he's out of the red jersey. So I think that's definitely a positive sign. It's, uh, it's looking good for him. Uh, limited participation, two days running now. Well, we've seen him uh, practice on very little, if to, to none, participation uh, at times before. This is a little different. He's coming off uh, actually missing time from the ankle as opposed to just a week-to-week uh, sort of maintenance uh, type of routine. But um, So he definitely needs the reps in practice since he is coming back from, from missing time. But uh, I think it's definitely a positive sign. And then uh, we, the ultimate uh, update will be tomorrow morning, uh, Mike McDaniel uh, speaking before his friday practice so the the only thing is what i'm trying to figure out is he going to play this week or is it this more of a limited week to say all right teron let's practice you this week and let's see how your body responds and then if you're all right into next week then next week we'll get you ready for the game i i'm almost getting that feeling that it might be kind of a, a week of let's see where your body's at and how it responds and if you can stay healthy And uh, we'll start Kendall this week anyway because he's in a groove right now. Or do you think this is, all right, uh, if he, you know, goes a full go tomorrow, which Friday's practice is really light, he's a full go for Sunday? Is that the way you're looking at it or, or the other way? Well, what you're saying is definitely a route that you can take, especially because you saw how encouraging uh, or it, it is encouraging to see the way Kendall Lamb played, uh, filling in uh, admirably at left tackle uh, just on Sunday. So uh, between him and Austin Jackson, the way they held up against uh, Chargers combination of Joey Bosa and Khalil Mack, then uh, that gives you some time. If Kendall Lamb was uh, was struggling out there and then uh, and the Dolphins gave up five sacks, and then that led to a loss, and now you're 0-1 and you need uh, to, to win in New England to avoid an 0-2 start, then uh, you probably rushed uh, T-Stead back at that point. But it certainly gives you that option. I think it'll just depend on how close he is, how ready he feels. He's played through a lot of injuries. Again, maybe that's part of why he is always dealing with an injury too. Um, maybe give him an extra week. Uh, I mean, I'd be in favor of that if uh, they did go that route. But uh, if Armstead is ready to play, then I, I think they'll they'll go ahead and, uh, and put him out there. Availability has uh, nothing to do with this question because obviously everybody brings that up with Tua. But if you add last year – and this game here this week, who's the best passer in the AFC East? Best passer in the AFC East. Ooh, and we're coming off Josh Allen uh, having four turnovers in a game. Uh, full body of work, then, yeah, you're, you're saying Josh Allen. Passer. Has- passer, I'm saying. Great okay. Passer. Yeah, now, Tua shows a lot of impressive things with his anticipation, the accuracy. Um, so, I would say still for body of work, then you you give Josh Allen the nod, but Tua is moving up rampantly, and he has a chance to overtake him. If this keeps going the way it's looking with Tua having games like he's having and uh, Josh Allen uh, still not getting over this uh, turnover, uh, almost like like he's got the yips. Yeah, but, but, even without, but even without the turnovers, he's still more accurate than him when it comes to completion percentage. Oh, Tua's more accurate, yeah, for sure. Yeah, There's well, different that, aspects to, to the quarterback. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. You, you, you have to give Josh Allen the nod as the better quarterback because he's done it over a longer period of time. Right. But I think in a short period of time, Tua has proven to be the better passer, the more accurate passer, on a consistent basis, a better decision maker on a consistent basis. Yeah. That's what I mean by, I don't mean by quarterback because obviously he needs to do a lot more to pass Josh Allen as a quarterback. So I get it, but just as a pure passer, I'm, I, I kind of see Tua as the best passer in the division right now. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, he's coming. He's coming. And, and Josh Allen, a lot of what he does is on the ground too. So when you look at overall quarterback play and maybe uh, people I'm factoring that into, into the equation as well. Uh, but um, no, that's quarterback. That, well, that's yeah. quarterback. I'm with you on the quarterback. Yeah. Uh, you, there's no way you put you in front of Josh Allen right now with his body of work compared to what Josh has accomplished. But I, I believe that Tua has proven to be the better passer out of the two. Because passer has nothing to do with arm strength. 
running, size, availability, just faster. I just yeah. see that guy at another level compared to to uh, Josh Allen. I don't yeah, know. And, and before that end of season run where uh, he had the two tough games at San Francisco, at L.A. especially, uh, and then uh, obviously the second concussion protocol stint uh, took him out of things. And Tua, let's not forget, was in the MVP running the same way now after one game. Tua is a co-favorite, maybe even a favorite, according to whatever odds makers you're looking at, uh, in that in that MVP race after uh, Patrick Mahomes didn't uh, come up with a Week One win in, in against Detroit. So uh, yeah, uh, the the recent history, uh, what what Tua has done in a short period of time since Mike McDaniel has arrived, since he's had uh, finally had weapons with him and, and Jalen Waddle, Year Two and Year Three, Tyree Kill, um, now for going on a second season with him, then yeah. What did you uh, What did you think of the explanation with AVG and David Long from Vic Fangio that we found out why AVG played more? They were more nickel packages, and he's the starter in the nickel packages. Is that a knock on David Long that that your big free agent signing isn't an every down linebacker? It is a little bit of a knock because. Uh, you went ahead and got him the first day that free agency opened. So that was kind of um, your your big signing. Obviously, right after you traded for Jalen Ramsey, then it was that weekend. Then right after that, he, he was, aside from, it was Mike White that first day and, and uh, David Long. So definitely a, a guy you were targeting. Uh, so, uh, and then if he's not in the nickel package and the nickel package is truly the base package because you're in it, um, let's say two thirds of the time, like they were against the chargers as opposed to one third. Uh, and then maybe some other packages as well, the dime, et cetera. But um, maybe if it's between those two, two thirds, one third split, then uh, that lends to that David long isn't on the field uh, very much. Now, Coaches have also said that uh, depending on different matchups, uh, they might get David Long in there for more snaps. But uh, that is a little concerning that he was a, a big acquisition, a big addition that you wanted to contribute. And then you only saw him for 17 defensive snaps. Uh, and some of those were uh, were not great run fits in, uh, in a game where you gave up more than 200 yards on the ground. Almost lends you to believe. Are they missing a, a presence like the Alandon Roberts, uh, what he provided uh, last year in that same role as a bigger, more physical, um, and also a leader type of uh, linebacker up next to Jerome Baker as the inside backers? Somebody was saying to me here, it says, uh, uh, hey, oh, Davis is still a doubter for whatever reason. And then I said, Davis who? And then he said, <laughs> David, the guy you're interviewing, you're, you're, not, a, you're not a Tua believer? Well, that's news to me because I have always been one of the more positive guys on Tua, even when he was, uh, oh, okay. All right. yeah, even when he was a little down. I, I, I thought that. so. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. no, I, I thought so. That's why when he, listen, that's why I, I wanted to ask because it was kind of weird. You know, listeners get shit wrong all the time. They, they, <laughs> they don't know who they're really reading or who they're watching or whatever. And then they, oh, you said that. No, I never said that. And then it was like somebody else on, on, you know, and it's just one of those things that does happen. So no, I, I, I only filled, I only filled in for Poopart uh, for that one month. That, that's yeah. what that was. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah, Poopart is probably still. Yeah, he's still an ins an insane man. He still probably is not a full <laughs> believer yet. Unfortunately, uh, we need to put the, the group text was awfully quiet him. from him uh, <laughs> after. What was that? that? The group text with him was awfully quiet after he until after, had the game he had. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would imagine. I would imagine. Yeah. I don't know where he gets his doubt of Tua. I, that that's the part I still don't understand. You could doubt all you want his physical, you know, his availability, you know, his durability. You want to doubt that? That's fine, dude. He's had a ton of problems with that. But I, I, you know, well, you know me. I've been to completely on his bandwagon from the get go because I've seen a lot of shitty quarterbacks here for decades. Yeah. And so I know that this guy's not a shitty quarterback. I know this guy can play, bro. He can yeah. play. And, the, and you, know, you know, one of the things that I, I talked about this earlier in, uh, on the show, the, the, everything's come together finally, David. And see, you overreact, not you, but, you know, the people that overreacted. Like when they drafted him. Okay, so you drafted an injured guy. So the first year, he wasn't going to be healthy. And the second year, it was the process of strengthening that core. So now you had a coach that didn't want you. You didn't have the offensive support that you needed, offensive line, running game, uh, coaches, all that kind of stuff. So now 
You're four years in, or this is going to be your fourth year. You're now two years removed from that surgery, so your core now is at its strength. It's at its max now. So now you're going to be able to get all the torque you can possibly get from your body, like you saw on that play where he runs out from the middle and and throws a 50-yard bomb you know, to Tyreek. So now he's in the same scheme and the same offense for two years with the same coach that believes in him, that gives him an offensive line because he wasn't running for his life last year. Say what you want about the offensive line, but they did good enough to have four and a half yards of carry for their backs, and Tua was not running for his life. When Tua got hurt, it's because he held on to the ball too long, not because Jesse Davis was on the field. Okay, so now you're seeing it. You're giving him more support. He has more experience. Now he has seen teams over and over again. He has seen coaches over and over again. He is now fully healthy. He now understands the league. He now understands his body. Bro, there's a reason why he's where he's at now. But if you're judging a guy when he comes right out of the draft and, and bro, in 10 months from a surgery, he's on the field getting slammed by, by Brockers. I mean, you know, come on, bro. You got to have, you got to have some patience and you got to have an understanding of what was around him that it was going to be impossible for him or offensive linemen to succeed. I'm now convinced of that too, by the way. Okay, because I'm watching Austin Jackson under them and Austin Jackson under this guy, and it's completely different under these guys. And Austin was kind of turning the corner last year, by the way, before he got injured. So maybe what we're watching from Austin this year is some of the stuff that we could have seen, you know, last year. So that's my point. My point is we, we sometimes we just rush to judgment and we don't take all the facts in and give the young man everything he needs in order to succeed. Now, physically, and everything around him, he has what he needs to succeed. And there it goes. Absolutely. And uh, even going back to that 2020 rookie season, before I was even on the beat and just watching the team, I was still uh, covering the Miami Hurricanes then, but uh, watching on Sundays. And uh, I remember I was surprised when he uh, was named the starter, what, six, seven weeks uh, into the year, because he was still coming off that hip injury. It wasn't even a full year. It was November of the year before when his college career was cut short. So I always kind of had the idea that you want to just give him that rookie year to just learn behind Ryan Fitzpatrick and let Fitzpatrick just uh, go that year. So I remember I, I always felt that rookie year, it was just too early to even get him in there. And then it gave people uh, this idea of what Tua is and just that that's the case in point, uh, all he can be when, no, there are a lot of factors that have to, that he has to uh, develop uh, is, and especially getting his health right uh, before you could really truly judge him. And then now uh, so much – and a lot of the points you hit on, boy, I'm feeling like this is exactly what has been in my uh, uh, season preview uh, stories on Tua the past two years um, in our big uh, preview sections uh, where uh, this year I talked to him uh, in exclusive – in an exclusive interview about just uh, everything aside from the injuries, just having the second year in the same system, how important that is and uh, how he's grown and matured, not only as a player, but uh, as a man being a father. And then how that has changed his approach and his mindset, uh, the way he leads. Uh, and then th the year before that, uh, how he has worked with um, uh, not only his uh, training staff, this training staff with the Dolphins, but on the side with uh, his personal trainer, Nick Hicks, and uh, improving that uh, torque, that, uh, that lower body strength that lets him uh, get his whole body into some of these throws and, um, and now has had him max out some of his uh, throwing potential on, on these deeper balls. And even that throw, that big third and 10, hey, he had practiced exactly that with, uh, with his trainer. And you see it come to fruition on a game day. So uh, this guy really, he, he checks all the boxes in his preparation and then you see it come true on game day. Let me ask you something. Since you covered um, college, let me go a little bit off the beaten path and stay in the same division, but talk about another quarterback. Is Ken Dorsey getting a little exposed there in Buffalo? Hmm. I guess you could say that. I mean, Josh Allen, uh, uh, a lot of this falls on his shoulders, but there, there's got to be some coaching that goes into uh, correcting some of these mistakes. Uh, a lot of it, these are decisions that have to be made on, on the fly by the quarterback, but um, I mean, Certainly, uh, there's probably some uh, play calling. I haven't taken such a deep dive into why Josh Allen is uh, is throwing these interceptions and still continues to, to turn the ball over. He's very loosey-goosey with the ball already as it is. You even saw it, even the, the fumble uh, that he had, uh, that wasn't anything like um, a, a throwing decision. It was just him. It, he 
mishandled the snap and then he wanted to make something happen and he's still not holding the ball uh, very tight, very firmly. So um, he's got to get uh, that corrected for sure. And uh, uh, Ken Dorsey, a, a guy who I grew up watching with those 2001 Hurricanes, but mm -hmm. uh, and, and he has uh, had a, tr a tremendous coaching career uh, moving up the ranks into OC, uh, but uh, he's definitely got to get that right with Josh Allen. By the way, I'm looking at Josh Allen's stats. You know, um, I think we might we might be overrating him a little bit too much, bro, because I'm looking at 35 touchdowns, 14 interceptions. That's just a little over two to one. That's not impressive, actually. 36-15. Uh, he had the one year where he had 37 and 10, but that's it. Outside of that, it's 10-12, 20 to 9. 36 15 35 14 and so far it's one of three to start off this year uh it's kind of interesting and he did you know this that he's only passed 65 percent completion percentage one time in his career the year that he was in the mvp race that's where he did the 37 and 10 it seems to be the aberration year it's 52.8 58.8 63.3 and 63.3 and you know elite quarterbacks start at 65 and up actually that's when you're elite if you're under 65 you're actually not putting up an elite com uh, completion percentage so two to one interception ratio and the completion percentage i gotta tell you something i think we're uh i think we're overrating this guy a little bit as a quarterback i'm just saying yeah. athlete different but quarterback i don't know yeah. I think sometimes what happens is once you see that one exceptional season, then you have it entrenched in your head. This is who he is now. Uh, once he kind of overcomes uh, some some earlier shortcomings and um, maybe not yet. I think a lot of the people on the outside still haven't seen it that way with Tua, probably more so because of the injuries, although he did perform well last year. But uh, even then, 25 to 8 is what he was last season in touchdown to interceptions. So that's basically 3 to 1. And it only got to 8 interceptions because – the last three of those interceptions he threw while concussed in the second half of his final game. So uh, before going into that fourth quarter against Green Bay, he was at 25 to five. So a five to one touchdown to interception ratio, which is just uh, bonkers, uh, really. So, uh, yeah, with Josh Allen going at a two to one clip, then uh, that uh, really speaks volumes uh, in that uh, argument. Sean? I was going to say, uh, our buddy Adam Beasley was on Joe Rose this morning. Oh, there he's he's an anti tool guy. Well, now, now he's turned the tables now, right? Well, he went in on Josh Allen. He came up with a stat. The last 19 games, do you know how many turnovers Josh Allen is accountable for? In 19 games? 19 I, games. I bet you it's, it's over 30. I was going to say 38. over 30. Yeah. 38. Yeah. It's two a game. Yeah. yeah. He's not a better passer than, than Tua, bro. He's not. He's not. Yeah. Hey. He's not. It's just not. Tua, Tua on a strictly passer. Yeah, I'm done with that. Yeah, <laughs> Tua. I am, uh, Tua was 25 to eight. He he was three yeah. to one this year, and that's not elite either. I want to get to like four to five to one in your in your interceptions to touchdown yeah. ratio. Three to one is still good, but it's not good enough. He still has to get better than that. Two to one, that's not good at all, bro. It's yeah. not good at all as a quarterback at all. And so that's, that's it's, it's interesting how you know. I, I told uh, Cam this a couple of times, you know, as much as Dolphin fans were worried about the old line, this is before the season started. This was just two weeks ago. I told Cam this. I said, be careful that the Dolphins don't have the best offensive line in the division. As much as people might be complaining, okay, the Dolphins may have the best offensive line in the division when it's all said and done. And you know it's better than the Jets line already as it is if you watch that. And I need to see the Patriots again, but I think it's actually better than the Bills line too. Uh, so it's kind of interesting, you know, how uh, sometimes people just, you know, I, I get it, bro. We're shell-shocked as Dolphin fans because everything used to go wrong for 20-something years. I just think things are different now, bro. You have a different coaching staff. You have a different front office. I think you have people that actually know what the hell they're doing. You mentioned the Jets offensive line, which already got the starting quarterback hurt over there uh, in a way that – and I just remember how the whole offseason with the uh, national media, New York-based uh, national media programs were all about can Tua stay healthy while hyping up the New York Jets uh, bandwagon. And then what do you know? It is the Jets who have the quarterback who is out for the season from week one, four plays in. And Tua is looking strong. It's just one week. He's got to play 17 games, but uh, 
threw one week looking strong, and uh, and now the the Jets uh, Aaron Rodgers is is out for the season. The thing also that a lot of us were a little nervous about was obviously the offensive line, but what we were really nervous about was the confidence that Chris Greer and Mike McDaniel showed in the offensive line. And everybody was, hey, go get this guy, go get that guy, this, that. Like, you know, Leo Collins got l- released, right? And I get bombarded just like you did. Hey, are we going to mm-hmm. go get Leo Collins? And I'm like, you guys know that they like Keon Smith? Like, they like him, and he's a young guy, and they want to develop him. And, and so I was just talking about this earlier on the show. We got to start taking a step back, bro. They found Brandon Shell who filled in. They found Robert Jones, who filled in. Uh, Wynn has done a nice job. Kendall Lamb, they brought him last year. Look what he's done overall. It looks like Austin Jackson might ch- might just turn the corner. Robert Hunt already did. So you hit. So if if you hit on two of your three drafted guys, you were successful. And if you found Brandon Shell and Robert Jones and Kendall Lamb and now Isaiah Wynn, then you're exceptional actually because you're finding people off the street. And so this is why they haven't made any moves and they kept so many guys, including Keon Smith who kind of went under the radar in training camp because he had some moments, but most of us, not me, I talked a little bit about him, but most of us really didn't talk about it. And this is why these guys have shown actually confidence in in their O-line situation, and the rest of us were kind of questioning it. Now we know why they weren't that worried. And Mike McDaniel is a believer in giving O lineman uh, a second year in an offensive system. That's why he's still well. Maybe Liam Eikenberg wouldn't be the best example this year. He didn't uh, earn the, the left guard spot, but that's why he was still up on Austin Jackson. And even though he didn't even see him his first season in the McDaniel offense uh, because of those two ankle injuries, so that's why he was still uh, very confident in Austin Jackson and uh, and Liam Meikenberg as well. But yeah, Isaiah Wynn ended up. Uh, taking that spot. So good on them that they had uh, that guy ready to go in who has played tackle mostly with the Patriots, but now uh, playing guard with the, with the Dolphins. So uh, Keon Smith, another example of a, a guy just working within the system. He was practice squad last year. And then even the offense before that uh, practice squad there. And we probably have to give uh, some credit to Butch Berry, a guy who was uh, yes. much aligned when he, uh, he had that one year as uh, Miami hurricanes, offensive line coach. Uh, it seems like he's doing a pretty good job. Uh, it, so far, so good with him uh, uh, running the Dolphins line. Yeah, yeah, everybody. I, I'm sure Frank Smith has to do something with this. And Absolutely. Mike McDaniel, I, I, I think I think you just have a, you know, um, I, I just think you have a core now of, of coaches that will allow their offensive linemen and quarterback to succeed. And I think that's really the issue now that you didn't have before in the foundation. Flo could not get the people to really develop the offense. I think you have the people now – because look at the second year. The receivers look so much more comfortable. The offensive linemen look so much more comfortable. It's just a different offense right now compared to last year when Tyreek and Tua were honest to say, hey, man, I didn't know the whole playbook yet, you know, because that's actually the normal thing. Really, most of these guys, when they get there, they don't really know the playbook the first year. It takes them a couple of years to really know everything and, and, and have everything down pat. It's just not that easy, dude. It's really, really difficult. Yeah, you know? absolutely. All right, uh, let's get prediction, bro. What do we got? Uh, the Dolphins, the line has gone up throughout the week from two and a half to three. So do you like the Dolphins this week on the road? Doesn't have to be the points in your in your case, but uh, do you like the Dolphins going on the road this week? Okay, good thing it doesn't have to be the points because I do have the Dolphins winning. I made this prediction in the Sun Sentinel, but I have Dolphins 24, Patriots 23. So I think this will be a very tight, contested AFC East battle. I think it usually is uh, on the road in the division. And, uh, yeah, Bill Belichick is going to have something uh, uh, in the works to try to limit Tyreek Hill. Tyreek's still going to get his, but you also, when you take away Tyreek Hill, that opens up a lot for Jalen Waddle. So that's the thing with the Dolphins. If you want to take away that that uh, number one option, that number two option is really most teams uh, number one. So, but I do like the Dolphins to to win a, a tight one, and it'll be tougher than uh, than a lot of people think. Uh, I th- a lot of people are down on the Patriots, but they uh, held their own pretty well against the Eagles in the opener, and um, 
Uh, maybe Mac Jones can turn a little bit of a corner now that he has an, an, an OC, but uh, uh, not too much. Don't worry. I'm not going crazy on Mac Jones, but I think he'll be just be uh, better uh, in his third year uh, now with Bill O'Brien there. And uh, and the, the defense is always tough, but the Dolphins uh, come out victorious. Any uh, Anybody from injury returning? Uh, for the Dolphins, well, uh, today's injury report, Raheem Mostert was uh, – uh, a full participant after he uh, technically missed the Wednesday practice. We did see him uh, at practice on Wednesday, although whatever participation he did have, it was not enough to qualify for even limited uh, on the injury report. So he was a DMP Wednesday. Uh, when we talked to him at his locker room today, he said it's nothing to worry about with the knee. Uh, he's only just receiving preventative treatment. And uh, it was more of a vet rest day while he still receives treatment on the knee. So uh, he'll be good to go. And as we mentioned earlier, Teron Armstead, he's out of that red jersey. So he had a second straight day of limited participation. Well, on the Patriots side, um, we had a cornerback, Jonathan Jones, pop up uh, with an ankle injury today. So he wasn't on the injury report Wednesday, and and now he just popped up as limited uh, today. So that's something to, to watch. All right. Good stuff as always. Follow him on Twitter at David Ferronis underscore. Catch his work there at the South Florida Sun Sentinel. Better yet, subscribe to it like I do and support him and all the other exceptional writers there on the Sun Sentinel. David, as always, thank you, my friend. Appreciate you immensely. We will uh, catch up uh, post game. We will talk on Sunday night, my friend. Sounds good. Big up. Thank you, sir. There you go. David Ferronis. He won't be in a hurry on Sunday night because. Uh, I doubt they're flying out that late, right? I doubt they have that. They probably have to stay over and all that. All right, good stuff. EJD Construction, by the way. We love Eric. Great people. Uh, strong sponsor and support the people that support us. Dade, Broward Counties, folks. Call them 305-433-4843. And they do it all. Shell Construction in-house, folks. That's how they keep the cost down. And, and, and again, we're talking about custom home construction and major home remodeling. Not a handyman. OK, so if you're looking to build an efficiency, maybe you want to build a second floor to your house. Maybe you want to build an observation deck. Maybe you want to modernize the kitchen, modernize your uh, your uh, man cave, whatever it is that you want to do. Custom home construction, major home remodeling. One of our listeners sadly had a fire. They had to have their home remediated. They did that. Dade and Broward counties. Call Eric. That's the owner's personal cell number. 305. 433-4843.